Ten years ago, Channel 4 started filming with six unique children, each born with a disability. This is baby's thigh and baby's knee, baby's shin. When you hear that your child isn't going to be normal, it makes you feel as though you're not part of the world that you always knew and that you're absolutely alone. You feel the guilt of the fact that she's going to have to go through all these struggles that I never went through. Do you know, life's hard enough as it is, but 10 years on, we're still fighting. As the children have grown older, we've been there every step of the way. While some have reached the milestones of every childhood. Disability doesn't mean that we just sit around, stay here like this all day, watching nothing. You can just be yourself, but you just need a little bit of help sometimes. Others have battled just to stay alive. It just makes you realise what life's about and just appreciate every minute. We all take so much for granted, and it can happen to any of us. We can have something taken away like that. In this final episode, the children must face up to the consequences of the decisions that they have made or that have been made for them. I could never have seen what we are today. It's like a whole new life for her. As one child's health deteriorates... She's gone 10 years with a lot of health problems, really, and you just think, well, things are slowly starting to fail now. Another will finally face the pioneering surgery that she has chosen to undergo. I completely trust Mr Gill with his eye. Like, a specialist around the world. I be capable hands, which was really good because then I know that I'm safe. There's no guarantee of success. It's trying to do something when doing nothing means severe disability. In Essex, it's an important day for 10-year-old Zoe Frew. If it goes on the grass here, that's a goal for you. And if it goes on the grass over there, it's a goal for me. Come then. We're off up to Oxford for Zoe to see the surgeon, for him to decide which arm he's going to operate on. She decided last time we went that she wanted her right elbow done, but he's given her an extra three months to see if the left arm could improve anymore. So we always knew that this appointment would be a matter of going, oh, it'll be the left elbow, or we'll go straight in to do the right elbow. And I'll just try and guide her through it and reassure her through it the best I can. Zoe was born with arthrogryposis, a condition which has severely affected the movement of her arms and legs. She spent the first few years of her life going through multiple operations in an attempt to walk. When I was little, I couldn't walk, really. I started walking when I was four. I walked out of nursery to my mum and she started crying. She took me to the park. Although the operations were a success, Zoe refused to entertain the idea of further surgery to help her bend her arms. They'd like to have one elbow bend in, just for functional use. So she'll be able to brush her teeth, brush her hair. But two years ago, Zoe changed her mind and underwent pioneering surgery to transfer a muscle from her chest into her left arm. <laughs> she has spent the last year waiting for the muscle to develop. But the last time she saw her surgeon, he was concerned that it was not getting strong enough to act as her new bicep. I would have liked to have seen it move a bit more. But despite the slow progress, Zoe was willing to try the same operation on her other arm. I've had loads of operations that I can't choose because I was really little. Mummy had to choose for me and maybe it's time that I should try. I need this operation to help me in my life. I think there's students who would say there's nothing we could do. And say this is your disability, get on with it. Um, but I think there is something you can do. So if we can make that difference for her, in the end, it would be worth it.
This morning, Zoe's family are making the familiar journey to Oxford for an appointment with her surgeon, Mr. Giel. They're hoping that he will see an improvement in her left arm and that it will not require further surgery. How are things? Fine. Fine. Been exercising? Yeah. yeah. And? Can you bend your arm a bit? A bit. <laughs> okay. Can I see? Working, but it's having trouble being strong enough. So although it's contracting, it's kind of, it needs to move about, you know, seven centimeters to go from full straight to full bend. Yeah. And it's probably only moving three, so it does a little bit of a bend and then not going all the way. And um, so I would like them to do an ultrasound of it to look at the size of the muscle. Yep. And because um, that will give us a guide as to whether it's going to continue to work get any bigger with exercise or something else. If they don't think it's, with exercise, going to get big enough, then we might have to move the other muscle. Because you know there's two chest muscles. Right. And I moved one of them. Yeah. Not the other one. Then that's, then that's the other option to, because it's not quite got enough oomph to move the other one. Right. To do that. I think I should set something up, an operation date, okay. and then we can kind of decide once the scan's done whether which one we do. Okay then. We'll get the scan on this and then we'll make a decision, yeah? Zoe's disappointed in the fact that he hasn't come along as much as he wanted it to, but we were well informed that, that this could happen. If you tell parents that everything's going to be hunky-dory and it's not like that, then that's a disaster. So you have to, I guess you just have to tell them the truth and say, look, if it works, it'll make a huge difference to her function and because the potential gain is so great it's worth taking some risks in trying to achieve that yeah in the next couple of months we'll be back here whether it be operating on left arm or right arm i don't even think that'll be decided till the day it's all the uncertainty isn't it you never know what's going to happen and we've just got to learn to get on with it off we go again Two days ago, 10-year-old Shelby Pate Williams was admitted to the Bristol Royal Hospital for children. She also had this vomiting. Uh, it's not just vomiting, she's got pain with it. She comes lethargic and um, her bowel stops working. And it's been going on for about a year now. So we've brought her back and forth and, you know, loads of different tests. She's had x-rays, barium, scans. They've tested urine, stools, bloods. Nothing's come up each time and they said that Shelby's stomach's failing and that there isn't anything they could do. There isn't any blame, it's no doctor's fault. They, if anything, it's because of them that she's been here for the last 10 years. If she is dying and things will start failing and, and we can't lose sight of that, that she's, you know, for the last 10 years she's been dying and yes, she's always defied the odds, but we've always known that's been the bottom line with Shelby's. Shelby was born with a rare chromosome disorder called partial trisomy 9p. She is profoundly disabled and has spent much of her life in and out of hospital. Ambulance, please. Um, I've got a daughter who's oxygen dependent and she's fitting. It's been going on for seven minutes. <laughs> Shelby's been fitting. She's every sausage on a stabilizer now. I can't do this. Shelby has a very limited life expectancy. I think it's a miracle that Shelby's still here, and, and you've, you know, it's it's a testament to your commitment and, and care. But from the day Shelby was born, Vicky hasn't stopped fighting to keep her daughter alive. I could have let her go. <laughs> Yeah. 
<laughs> Shelby is back in hospital once again, and in spite of two days of tests, doctors have been unable to get to the bottom of what has been making her so unwell. Hugh Thomas said, I don't think she's diabetic. He said, but we need to sort of definitely make sure. But I don't know what, what lines are thinking on now. But he did mention diabetes in front of Shelby, so he's put an idea into her head. <laughs> she realises she hasn't got that, she might have a go at it. <laughs> Her medical team have discovered that the level of glucose in her blood is unusually high, so they've taken another sample. I'll be happy with under seven. Oh, it's not come up yet. No, six seconds to the egg. 20.9. Six seconds. Oh, yeah. We'll have a quick chat with our endocrine colleagues <laughs> and uh, make a plan from there. Shelby's blood sugar levels are nearly three times higher than the normal range which should be between four and eight millimoles. But with their other children waiting at home, Vicky and Nick have to head back to Wales. Hugh Thomas rang. Um, he'd come on the water to see us, but we'd just missed him. And he said that, um, that Shelby has got diabetes, which was just what you don't want to hear. People with diabetes can, you know, if, if their sugar levels are low, they can say, well, I'm not feeling right, I need to have something. Whereas Shelby can't say to me, Mum, I feel a bit faint, I don't think my levels are right. And um, I think it's just the last few days has just been so up and down, obviously with her stomach and now this on top. And we're feeling pretty tired anyway, so I think it's just <laughs> drained the last bit of energy from us. So I'm just a bit gutted, really, for Shelby's. It's now December, and Zoe is back at the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford. Hello, I'm Zoe Froome to be admitted. Come in. Thank you. She's been booked in to have more surgery. Thank you. But the family still don't know which of her arms is going to be operated on. Sure. Zoe's surgeon, Mr. Giel, has asked for her left arm to be scanned so that he can check the development of the muscle he transferred to her elbow. How are you? Okay. Yeah. The bend that she's been getting isn't as successful as he had hoped. And there is a chance that the muscle will never get strong enough to fully bend her arm. So that's it there. there. Much? Yeah. And you pass it down onto the vessels. So it's on top of the vessels, and then it's sutured distally to sort of what remained of biceps. They're obviously seeing something on the screen that I'm not. I just see black and white fuzz. It's, it's hard. Before deciding what operation to offer Zoe, Mr. Giel also wants to scan the right-hand side of her body to check which potential muscles would be available to transfer to her right elbow. And on this side? Nice, bulky. Hey, Sorry, can you? Yeah. yeah. There, it's all, all, all like major. Really well. <laughs> that looks pretty good. Maybe just a little bit stringier than usual, but okay, that's pretty good. The scan has given Mr. Giel a stronger understanding of what is going on inside Zoe's left arm. Right, so the scan has shown us that this muscle is pulling, but it's just not pulling enough um, so that it can't shorten enough to bend your arm. Um, so it means to make that arm bend better, we'll have to move the other muscle. Okay. Okay? And the scan showed that the other muscle is there, and it's, well, I know it was there because we saw it last time. Mm. So we could do that. Yeah. And the situation's the same for this arm, in that we'd have to release your elbow and then have a look in your armpit and pick a muscle. Have you thought about which arm you want us to do? Um. So do you want us to work at making this one a bit better? Or do you want us to release this elbow and do this one? Do you want us to do that one? Okay. Cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. Nothing. Speak your mind. I know you got thinking something. It's just my baby's already. That's all. You, She's you worried make, about you. Mm -hmm. You make your own decision. 
And if that's the arm you want to go for, you know that I'm with you 100%. It's your choice, it's your body. Right, right arm it is then. Mm -hmm. I will right arm. Should we sign a form? You need something to lean on? No, I'm fine. Sure. In less than 24 hours, Zoe will be going through major surgery once again. But this time, it will be on her more dominant arm. Excellent. Zoe's so shown such maturity today and has just made these big decisions and has gone into it so enthusiastically. Whether she'll still feel the same tomorrow, who knows, but at the minute, she's doing well. There's a huge emotional and physical investment, particularly for Zoe, but also for her mother, because she's just thinking, oh, my poor child, she's gonna have another operation, I'm responsible, you know, the anxiety is just, must be hard to cope with. The upside, I think, is such that it, it's worth it. I'm just writing my Christmas cards because I won't be able to do them when I have the cost. So it gives this HD. It's going to take a long while. <laughs> How are you feeling about having the right arm done? I don't feel proud of myself yet. Why is that? Because, like, I haven't done it yet, so <laughs> I feel brave a little bit. <laughs> In the South Island of New Zealand, Hamish McLean is now 10 Whoa. years old. I love both my mum and dad, and my dog, Harry. He's the most important thing in the world to me. Hamish has achondroplasia, a growth disorder commonly known as dwarfism. His final height is unlikely to be more than four foot four inches. Even though I was born with a disability, I don't feel any different to other people. <laughs> Hamish's parents, Alistair and Claire, found out during pregnancy that there could be complications with the birth of their son. We were told he was going quite a high chance that he would die at birth. And so I felt robbed of my pregnancy. And then I thought, I'm never going to be robbed of time again with him, and I'm going to enjoy the now. Determined to give Hamish a full and active childhood, the family moved to New Zealand in 2003. It's been really nice to show Hamish Kiwi life as a child, which is beaches and outdoors and tree climbing. As Hamish has grown older, the difference in height between him and his peers has become increasingly noticeable. In the past, he's been upset when people have asked him how old he is and stuff like that. Whereas I think now he's becoming less affected by what other people say. I'm the smallest boy in the class, but being little does not matter to me or my friends. We all just play together. Oh, uh, he's my best friend. He's just normal like everybody else. He just, when he came to school, he just said, do you want to be friends? And then, yeah, started being friends. <laughs> oh, my God! Hamish! I think it's great to um, see his confidence and see him be equal to his peers. And they actually respect him for it. Oh, he's pretty good, yeah. Tries everything I do, really. <laughs> I don't mind having Akon to play as well because my friends don't mind it as well. And it's okay. Most of the time, 
now, it doesn't occur to me that he's not going to fit in. Just don't think about it, really. He is becoming more secure in himself, and definitely. In six months' time, Hamish will be making the leap from primary to secondary school. It is our job to give him what he needs in terms of the way he thinks, the way he feels about himself as, as he grows up. Yeah, no question about that. Um, and I hope in due course it'll turn out that we've achieved that. Hope so. Mm -hmm. Who knows what the future holds? No idea at all. My goal is to have fun. So far, it's been great. Come on, have you shut the back door? In Wales, the Pate Williams family are getting ready to make the journey to the Bristol Royal Hospital for Children. You might just leave it. You can have it when you get to the hospital. No. No, leave it. Shelby was diagnosed with diabetes, and Vicky and Nick were taught how to manage her insulin levels at home. But Shelby continued to be sick and has been in hospital for the last three weeks. Her diabetes actually has been the easiest part of her care and she's been quite good with it. But for whatever reason, her stomach doesn't seem to be tolerating anything. Two weeks ago, Shelby had an operation to insert a feeding tube that would bypass her stomach in the hope of stopping her from vomiting. Last week they said that she could go home, so we packed all her stuff, packed the car up, and um, came back to get her. And a uh, doctor came in and said that Shelby has tube neuropathy, which is um, leaky kidneys. So we're not any closer to home at the moment. When they're ill, you're obviously emotionally, you're all over the place and you're concerned because you don't know what's wrong or whatever. But every time, we think we've got on top of it. She seems to throw something else in. With Shelby's kidney function now cause for concern, an ultrasound scan has been booked for this morning. Just get your dress in there. Get your dress. <laughs> Dr Thomas said if you've got um, filtered coffee, you get a good filter and it will drain just the coffee through and all the crappy bits are left at the top. Um, you get a cheaper one, and sometimes you've got all the other rubbish bits that aren't meant to leak through, leaking through. He said that's the best way to describe what her kidneys are doing right now. <laughs> She's never had a problem with her kidneys, so they don't know why she suddenly has now. The ultrasound will be able to reveal if the damage to Shelby's kidneys will have any long-term consequences. If she was an ordinary kid who had kidney failure and I thought, well, yeah, she's going to get a transplant, then I put her through that on the hope that she'd have the transplant and life would be good again. But for Shelf, she won't get that transplant, so... She's dying anyway, so if they've got a, a Shelby child and a healthy child lined up, you know they're going to prioritise, and quite rightly so. If that child could have a transplant and that would be it, you know, they, they can carry on and have a healthy life, and then, of course, they should have a chance over her. I'm not saying I'd find that easy, but it is right. If you didn't know Shelby, you'd never met her and you read her sort of medical history, you think, how the hell is that child still alive with all those medical problems? I mean, she's, her, her lungs, her kidneys, her, her heart, her pancreas, you know, there isn't anything, her stomach, there isn't anything that does work properly on her anymore, but she still manages to act as if they're in a problem. When she's got nothing left in her, then I know enough's enough. At the John Radcliffe Hospital in Oxford, Zoe is about to undergo major surgery on her right arm. You feeling all right? Did you want to listen to some music? What one are you putting on first? I diverted higher. Is it working?
The last time Mr. Giel operated on Zoe, the results of the muscle transfer weren't as beneficial as everyone had hoped. But despite this, Zoe is still determined to try the same procedure all over again. If you do one side and it's a great success, then when you do the other side, you're kind of, you're really on a winner. Whereas it hasn't been a rip-roaring success. It's been, frankly, it's disappointing what she's got. Although it bends and it's quite strong, it's not, it's not good enough to be useful to her. Do you feel nice and relaxed? I'm proud of you. Let's get all your bits unplugged and then we'll uh, go for a ride on your bed. I completely trust Mr Gill. He's like a specialist around the world, which is really special. Only capable hands, which is really good because then I know that I'm safe. Clive, do you want to sleep with Although it's nice that they kind of trust me enough to have a go on the right side, it is also almost like double the responsibility than the first time because, you know, the pressure's on. She's got a lot of trust in you, Mr. Gale. I know, that's daunting. <laughs> Zoe could be in theatre for up to eight hours. Before Mr. Giel starts the muscle transfer, he first needs to release Zoe's elbow. Having just taken that bit of gristle off means it's bending a little bit more already. But we'd like to get more than that, so, so you can get a hand up to her mouth. The tendon in Zoe's elbow is currently too short to allow it to bend past 90 degrees. Let's have a knife, thanks. Before the new muscle can be transplanted, Mr. Giel needs to cut and lengthen Zoe's tendon to allow the elbow to bend fully. So she can now bend to you know, 120, 130 degrees, which is good enough for her to reach her own shoulder. So we'll stitch that up now. Having lengthened the tendon by five centimeters, there's now nothing restricting the movement of Zoe's elbow. So the first part of the operation's done, the elbow's released, bends sufficiently now and then we'll um, we'll stitch this up and then move to looking in the armpit for the muscle. Although the scan has showed that Zoe does have available muscles to transfer, there are no guarantees that any of them will be suitable. It's part of doing developmental problems in children is you never really know what you're going to find. Every time it's a, it's a bit of an exploration, you need to have a look really. There's no guarantee of success. It's trying to do something when doing nothing means a severe disability. In Burnley, 10-year-old Emily Spears is getting ready to go on a school trip. Did you do a check? Money? How much did you put in? 20 pence. Is that enough? <laughs> no, I'll put your five pound in. That's all right then. That's all we need. This trip Bye. will be the first time in her life that Emily has spent two nights away from home without her parents. How many did we pack? 15. Now, your cameras, do you want me to wind them on? No, they'll be alright. Are you sure? Will we be yeah. able to do it? Yeah. Yeah? You've got everything, haven't you? Yeah. Are your trainers in there? 
Mum. What? I'll be texting Miss Allen. Have you checked? Put it She's brushed her teeth, done her hair, uh, done her catheter, taken her tablets. I'm like, for goodness sake. I won't, I promise, because I'm going to have a word with her. Swear to God. No, exactly. <laughs> you see. I'm in your six month. I don't need me imagine to brush my teeth. Sorry. <laughs> <sighs> Ten years ago, Emily was born with spina bifida, a condition caused when the bones of the spine do not completely form. This can result in permanent nerve damage anywhere in the body. Hold your toes, Emily. We had no indication how she would be. Um, we just had given to us a range of possibilities. Um, so we kind of erred on the side of caution and thought worst case scenario. By the time Emily was three, it had become clear that she was doubly incontinent and she spent the first nine years of her life in pull-ups. We went to the hospital and they said, you're going to have to have an operation and I burst out crying because I didn't want it. But then my mum and my dad said, no, well, you've got to have it if you want to get better. So, yes, I heard it. It's good. A year on, and she's now able to go to the toilet independently. I'm really pleased that she can do this. Um, and she can go away um, and not, not need us. But I'm proper misser. Have a good time. See ya, Bobby. Oh, what's all this, the butties? <laughs> yeah, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Arms on. It's just like another step, another step a bit further away from us. Thanks a lot. This trip is not only the first time that Emily has spent two nights away from home, it's also the first time Richard and Rachel have left her alone to look after her own personal care. Right, I've got the top one. Top is the best. Floating so away. Okay, so you paddle forwards for now and then Gigi will help you out. Right, okay, so everybody paddle forwards. We're having a race! <laughs> Come on! There we go. Emma um, will just. Uh, she'll just be loving it. She won't. She won't be homesick or anything like that. And, you know, she'll have a go at everything and uh, she'll really enjoy it. I know she will. The whole reason that she had the surgery was so that she could live her life independently and her, her going away for two nights, it's, it's just massive. I think it is a big thing yeah. for our mums and dads because like, they, they haven't known us sleep out with our mates from school before, so... They've got nothing to worry about, but they think like they, they think that they get it's major and there's everything that you need to remember. Well, I think that's all that parents really do worry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, uh... I could never have seen what we are today. It's like a whole new life for her, and yeah, I think it's like you know the end, the end of the whole having the surgery and. And you know, this is this is what we did it for. For our independence. Yeah, best thing we ever did. Apart from Ava. <laughs> In Oxford, Zoe has been in theatre for the past two hours. Her surgeon, Mr. Geel, has successfully released the tendon in her elbow, 
giving it the full range of passive movement. His next job is to find a suitable muscle to transfer into the arm. What normally bends your elbow is your biceps muscle, which is the big one that bulks up when you exercise. And underneath that, there's another muscle called brachialis. And so those two things help you to bend your arm. And in Zoe's case, those muscles didn't form. We don't know why they didn't form, but they didn't. And um, so that's what we're trying to reconstruct. We're trying to move another muscle in to replace one that was never formed in the first place. So now I'm exploring her armpit to see whether the back muscle that we sometimes use to remake your arm, whether she's got it. And um, I don't think it's good enough. Despite, you know, the scan yesterday saying, oh yeah, yeah that looks like I can see one. It's only a very few fibers of muscle. It's less than a centimeter wide and very thin. So it's not gonna be good enough. So we can't move it. So I'm gonna have a look at her pec major now. As Zoe's back muscle isn't big enough, Mr. Giel's next option is to look for a more substantial muscle on the right-hand side of her chest. This is the pec major muscle here. It's a nice muscle, nice and thick, chunky, it's good. I'm much more optimistic about this than the other side. So now I'm going to dissect this muscle out and harvest it so I can transfer it into the arm. The next two hours are spent carefully removing the pec major muscle from Zoe's chest. So that muscle is then going to be tubed a little bit like this. So you can see it's a nice big fat muscle. And I'm going to make a tunnel here. I'll pull it down a bit more. Um, by releasing a little bit more around the top and then stitch it to the bottom end. And then hopefully she, when she brings her arm in, it'll bend her elbow. Zoe's pec major muscle is now ready to be used as a bicep. And Mr. Giel's last job is to sew it into its new home. So we're now going to pass the muscle into the arm. After eight hours of surgery, Zoe's operation is finally over. Thanks. Sloppy wet. There's your needle. Thank you very much. Can I take that? Yes, please. So that muscle came from here. And um, it's now sitting in her arm. She thinks it's going to be good as well. She... It is, it's going to be good. Love you too, darling. You've done so well. I'm really pleased that we could find a healthier muscle with much more bulk to transfer than the one we did on the other side. And her elbow's nice and bent and it moves without too much resistance. And so I think it'll be better. I think the side will be much better. In Wales, it's been three months since Shelby was seriously ill in hospital. Vicky and Nick had feared that their daughter's kidneys were starting to give up on her, but scans showed that there was no severe damage. Doctors were able to stabilize the required balance of chemicals in Shelby's body and she was able to go home. The last month or so, she's been absolutely amazing. Really, really well, really, really energetic, really happy, totally different child. But the last mission, she managed to get so many diagnoses. <laughs> um, it's just been so hectic this year, back and forth to the hospital so much. And as soon as she seems to be getting over one thing, she had something else that you don't have a chance to think you just keep going because that's what you have to do. 
Having spent so much time in hospital this year, today Shelby has something to celebrate. Happy birthday to you. Who is that? Who is that? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Shelby. Happy birthday to you. If you'd said to me, oh, I should probably be around for ten years, there's no way I would have believed it. Every year, I'll sit in her bedroom and think, well, she never has another birthday. What? And yet, she ceases to amaze me every time. Eleven just sounds so grown up. I don't know why, just... Yeah, she's done amazingly. It's now been 10 years since Channel 4 started filming with six different families and their children. Every two years they meet up. It's been a chance for them to get together and share the experiences they've had of bringing up their children. It's always lovely to meet up with everyone because it, I think it doesn't matter what disability your child has when it's to do with your children. You, every parent gets the same feeling. What song is that? That is very nice. <laughs> you do, and it's every couple of years, and in between, you kind of keep in contact, but it's not the same as getting together and catching up and seeing for yourself how the children are doing, and yeah, it's brilliant. Love it. This past decade has been a unique journey for all of the families, right from the start. Having a kid with a disability, I'm sure every parent asks, you know, was it what we did, or he did, or I did? And I think you could just destroy yourself going down that track. Actually, you know, you've got the most beautiful baby, and you can just enjoy that baby and love that baby to pieces. There's not a lot not to be positive about with, with Hamish, because he's such a good kid. This is my friend, Hamish. I think the last 10 years have, have just been a roller coaster. He's survived two lots of major invasive brain surgery. He's learnt to walk, he's learnt to talk. He has a quality of life. He is happy and yeah. he makes us happy just being here. Everything we've ever sort of wanted for Nathan and tried to achieve with him, he kind of just, he does these things so he, he never kind of lets us down in any way. Everybody wants to get to a point where they have an independent adult going out in the world and as much as possible, that's like what we want for Nathan. Can we say what she hasn't been through the last 10 years? And that's it. <laughs> the hardest things that she's ever had to do is just stay alive. Hey. You keep going because you don't think about it too much, is when you start thinking about it too much, you can't cope with it. And actually, she'll pick up on that attitude as well, won't she? Yeah. She'll think, well, you've given up on me already. Until she gives up, we can't give up. Our last 10 years have been very eventful very heartbreaking at times. But there's nothing, nothing that I'd change. I won't change it. Zoe is still recovering from the surgery she had on her right arm. It could be up to a year before she will find out if it's been a success. There has been times, especially this last time, where I seriously question whether I've done the right thing. But she's willing it to work. She's like, this is my right arm, this is my best arm, this is going to work. As the children move into the second decade of their lives, their parents are starting to think about the coming teenage years and their hopes for the future. I think if, if the next 10 years, William can be as happy as he's been in the last 10 um, overall, um, and if we can get through it without having any more major invasive surgery, um, if we can get through it with Paula still being reasonably healthy and being able to move around, then I'll consider that to be a good 10 years. I just want Zoe to carry on being the person that she is, because if she carries on with the determination and that smile, she'll accomplish anything that she wants. I've got no ambitions for Shelby. If she wasn't dying, you'd probably, oh, it'd be lovely if she did this, she'd love it. 
but you can't think that far. We're just grateful for every day that we have with her, aren't we? I mean, I don't know still 100% what will be out there for him as an adult, but I feel as if he will achieve something and he will be, you know, have a job and a girlfriend. I, I still feel all of that for him. I do hope my next 10 years are a bit quieter. I'll be honest. You won't be. I'm shattered. I want a peaceful life now. Thank you very much. We've done our bit. Yeah. The thing now. is, though, she's 10, so yeah. the next 10 years, oh, God. she's going to be going out and boyfriends and... She's not. No, she's not. I might, in 10 years, I might wish I had the previous 10 years again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it changes your expectations in life. Um, it changes your outlook on life. Um, but I wouldn't change it for the world. My favourite part of this last ten years is meeting. Emily, Hamish, Shelby, Nathan and William and me. Support information for parents, family members and children living with disabilities online at channel4.com. Just search for Born to be Different.